Triple Rahasya, the mystery of the three cities, the secret of the three cities, an amazing tantric text, a shakta text about the female energy or the goddess. I have very often people who write to me wanting to have initiation in Sri Vidya. And I do know that many of these people who write to me have a very different understanding of Sri Vidya. For many of these persons, it's ritualistic. It's about goddess worship and the Samaya tradition as we teach it in our tradition as well as the way this text presents it is a non-ritualistic tradition. It is a yogic tradition, which means direct experience of the divinity. Shri, or the goddess, is all this around us. The world, all this play of consciousness, is the power of Shri, the goddess. We have started the last time the brief um, story where as we know the the text is about the discussion between student Varshurama and the teacher Dattatreya and during the course of this discussion Dattatreya always narrates various stories the last story that we heard was the story of Mahasena who entered into the mountain with a, with a young yogi, the son of the great sage who was in deep meditation and this young yogi has created an entire world, nay, entire universe <laughs> in this mountain. Within the mountain is an entire universe and time is different within this mountain. It moves in a different way. So when Mahasena and the young yogi come out of the mountain, they find that tens of thousands of years have passed on earth and Mahasena has lost all his relatives, his kingdom, his friends, his family, everything that he knew is gone. Gone. And he is totally shattered, so shattered that he collapsed, he fainted. And he asked this yogi to help him understand what happened. And yogi explains that everything is like a dream. Why get attached? All the waking state is also a dream. Just like your dreams keep changing, they are transient. You know this is not reality. Similarly, everything in the waking state is also not real. What I find most beautiful and most amazing about this story is that it really is very much in line with modern physics. For those of you who may have dabbled a little bit or have an interest in quantum physics, astrophysics, you see the connection between these and these texts. There are two texts which really bring this out very beautifully, this connection between modern physics and ancient wisdom. One is this one, the Tripura Rahasya, and the other is the Yoga Vashishta. So this amazing text talks about him entering a mountain and... I mentioned it to you the last time. If you watch the movie Interstellar, it's a very similar kind of <laughs> experience. The movie makes you very contemplative because the story is about a man who leaves behind his, I think, 10-year-old daughter to go to a different galaxy through a wormhole, I think it's called, and he is close to a... He's, he lands on a planet which is very close to a, I think it was a neutron star or a black hole, and 
that had a different sense of time. Eventually, when he returns back, his daughter has become a grandmother, and he is the same. He has not aged. And so that sense of time makes you very contemplative. That movie is wonderful for those of you who have not seen it. Definitely uh, a nice movie to watch. So this chapter, we are now going to continue the text. Chapter 14 continues with the story, with the conversation now between Mahasena, who is asking the yogi to help him. The so young yogi is guiding him and how to deal with this very sudden and unexpected situation. The chapter is called Sankar Shakti and how the way to attain it. Do remember that these stories actually are messages of how to certain core messages which come through. And in this part of the story, the core message now is about Sankar Shakti or willpower. After listening to the sage's son with his purified mind, Mahasena started seeing things more clearly, comparing the objects of the external world with the objects seen in the dreaming state. He attained freedom from sorrow. With courage and freedom from sorrow, he asked the son of the sage, O oh, great wise one, you can see beyond. You have profound knowledge and know that which can be known through the sense and that which senses cannot reach. However, still there is something I do not understand. Kindly answer my questions. You said that all this happened through imagination? How? No matter how much I imagine something, it does not necessarily occur outside me. Because your willful thinking is perfected, you could materialize a whole universe inside a hill. This external world and the hill world coexist. Why then are there differences between time and space in the two worlds? Surely one of them must be unreal. Which is it? For those who may not recall, we left off the last session with the sage's son saying that with imagination, visualization or willpower, you can create worlds. You can create entire worlds for yourself. You can materialize universes. And this can materialize in the external world. The stuff, the whatever you imagine. And Mahasana says, yeah, how is that possible? Because however much I try to imagine, it does not manifest. So one of them must be unreal. So the yogi replies, Here, imagination is identical with determination, which is of two kinds, perfect and imperfect. Imagination without doubt is helpful. The absence of doubt means the continuity of one thought. The universe is in existence because of the desire of Brahma, the creator. Brahma created the universe with his powerful thinking. The world created by your desire and will was not created with determination and will like the creation of Brahma. So what the yogi says basically is we can all imagine. I'm sure many of you have imagined or desired things and imagined them. But what you did not have was the determination or the will behind it. So imagination accompanied by willpower, very intense desire, can be fulfilled, will manifest. But we need that intense willpower. And how does one create this entrance? Uh, intense willpower this kind of determination. O 
or prints, there are varieties of siddhis. One is by birth, the second is by obtaining a jewel, the third is through herbs, the fourth is through yoga sadhana, the fifth is through austerities, the sixth is through mantra, and the seventh is through a boon. Brahma received that power by birth. Yakshas and demons through gems. Devas through herbs. Yogis through yoga. Austere people through austerity. Mantra adepts through mantra. And the celestial architect, Vishwakarma, through a boon. So let's go through these different varieties of Siddhis once again. And the very first one we see is birth. Now, what may be a Siddhi to one person is totally natural to another. So you see, one is born perhaps in a situation where he is not or she is not blessed with certain talents. So you may have somebody who is not very good at art, it's not very good at math. But somebody else is really good at math, really good at art, can paint amazing things within seconds. You know, it just looks, just everything that person touches is art. Think of Picasso. If you're thinking about math, think of some great mathematician. And you know that these people had a certain talent, certain aptitude that others don't have. So in a sense, from a certain perspective, you'd say this is a Siddhi. And not everybody has these. So willpower, for example, is also a Siddhi. Some people just have it, have a very, very strong, dominant willpower. The others need to cultivate it. Just like a talent like art, not everybody has brilliant talent. It's not a, a genius like Picasso, but you can cultivate the skill. Perhaps you will never be as talented as Picasso, but you'd be a good artist all the same. Or a musical genius like Mozart. Maybe not everybody can create music with such ease as Mozart did, but with a lot of practice, you can cultivate the skill. So it is true also for sadhana, for willpower. Siddhis can also be obtained through jewels. We talked about this last time. Or was it the time before? One of those times we talked about jewels, that certain jewels, metals, gems have, stones have certain powers. The description I had given you to help you understand this was iron and, and a magnet. Magnet is a kind of a stone which attracts iron and it will attract certain other things around it and it creates a field around it. So just as iron is attracted to a magnet and this lodestone or magnet creates a field, magnetic field around it. So other precious stones have in their own way certain field. And just as magnets can influence certain objects around it, so also certain precious stones influence us in different ways influence the very subtle pranic energies in certain ways, very subtle ways. And using these precious stones, we can, for example, come out of uh, inauspicious circumstances in our life. This is called Jyotish Vidya and it is a Vidya or a science in India, not... Um, all Jyotish today are really authentic and not everybody in India, the Jyotish in India, have mastery over this ancient science. It's true that there are many black sheep now, but 
there are still some who are genuine and are able to help you work out your karma through the use of precious stones. For example, use of pearls, use of silver, use of different precious metals to help you with your karma. The third form of Siddhi is through herbs. Now, we're not just talking about having some herbal teas here, but the study of Ayurveda was in fact this very deep study and knowledge or science of different plants, herbs, med medicinal herbs, and their influence on the body, the subtle pranic channels, and through this influence, it helped you to work out negative karma and heal you of deeper disease. So while modern medicine focuses purely on the body level and tries to, in a way, cure you by removing for example, bacteria or, you know, infection, partly suppressing the immune system and fighting these uh, through antibiotics. But herbs do not do that. They support the immune system and not suppress it. They do not fight those uh, germs or bacteria, but they work with the subtle energy level and bring more energy into the body, channelize the energy in the body and remove blockages. So through the removal of blockages, negative karma is, is attenuated and the body acquires greater health, the mind is also healthier and the person acquires a different way of looking at things requires therefore also greater Sankalp Shakti because conflicts, internal conflicts are removed. Any questions about the Siddhis through birth, through jewels and through herbs? Okay, everybody seems to be happy. The fourth is through yoga sadhana. And through yoga sadhana, as most of you probably know, is different techniques, different practices help us get to know ourselves better, help us to unlearn negative mental and behavioral patterns. And by the unlearning of these unhealthy habit patterns, a lot of positive energy is released, a lot of pranic energy is released. This pranic energy, which was blocked in the body, was causing disease. But when this pranic energy is released, the body gets greater health and internal conflicts are removed. So... The process of yoga sadhana is a process not only of breathing practices but also of meditation, dhyan, deeper practices. Yoga sadhana does not here necessarily mean asanas. A lot of people believe that just by practice of asanas they're going to get healthier. Asanas may help to the body to be a little bit more flexible, to gain a certain amount of um, health in terms of being able to, to overcome basic stiffness of the body, but it does not necessarily help you get healthy, as in the removal of disease. 
And this physical health one can also get through gymnastics, going to different gyms, you know, fitness, to to uh, jogging, playing team sports, games, different kinds. So it's not like we need to do asanas in order to get really healthy. For real health, which means the removal of disease, you need to do something more than physical. You need to go to the level of the prana or the mental level. These are the two deeper layers, deeper than physical layer. So the fifth, so these two austerities. So austerities means taking up certain disciplines. So discipline in food, for example, discipline of such as when you go to bed, when you when you get up, you don't sleep too much, don't sleep too little. Disciplines like these are very, very common throughout the world from all religions, which have, uh, in most religions of the world, alcohol, for example, is taboo, or certain religious times, festivals, the eating of meat is forbidden. So there were certain reasons for these and the reasons is that this kind of discipline also helps us acquire greater willpower. And I think that is quite easy to understand that when you make up your mind to, to stop having coffee or tea, it, it makes you practice your a certain muscle called willpower. It's like a muscle. Willpower is not really different. When you exercise a muscle, the muscle gets stronger. Similarly, when you exercise your willpower, you train it, it gets stronger. The fourth, uh, or rather the sixth one, is through mantra practice. Mantra practice is actually another form of austerity. It's a discipline. Also, yoga sadhana is a form of discipline. You take up a certain practice and you do this practice, irrespective of what happens. And so, some of my students, when they do mantra practices, they, they would do it for a period of 10 months or longer, and then they have to do it for a certain amount of time and they do it every day, irrespective of whether they are sick or busy. I even go to the extent of saying that even if you're dying, you do this practice because it's very auspicious if you die when you're doing your mantra practice. And of course, they, they laugh about it and it's just a bit of fun. But there's a, a bit of truth in that that these practices really will strengthen your willpower a great deal. The seventh one is a boon. A boon is something that a wish that is fulfilled through divine means. Now here it says the celestial architect Vishwakarma Acquired so these through a boon, these yakshas, demons, devas, these are all things that have been mentioned, but also through deep meditation, one can acquire um, boons and these can be fulfilled. Through deep meditation, one does come in touch with the divinity within and with also with divine beings. Some of you may have heard of the mythological stories where certain kings or even asuras, the demons, practiced deep, very, very terrible austerities and acquired boons from certain gods which and with those boons they made a complete nuisance of themselves 
the Asuras uh, wanted to have power or they wanted to have wealth and they became evil and then of course uh, they made a nuisance of themselves. But these stories illustrate to us that through austerities and practice we can develop very very strong willpower and this willpower helps us to acquire the things we desire. Any questions about these seven cities? Yes, Manisha. Can you tell me the second one, please? The, the second city that was uh, through gems. Oh, right, right. The stones and gems. Yes, okay. the stones so and gems. First, sure. Birth, then stones and gems. Third is herbs. Fourth herbs. is yes, yoga. Fifth is austerities. Sixth is mantra and Seventh is through boons. Thank you. Okay. So, um, by self-determination, the past sankalps are forgotten. Sankalp should be done with full determination. One should wash off all those old stains of the mind in order to make new and effective disciplines. Such a one-pointed concept should, cannot be obstructed in any way. All great things can be achieved through such a power. Your mind is not one-pointed and concentrated. Therefore, you should learn to focus your mind. The word one-pointed is very important here. Sankalp is very, very closely related to the idea of a one-pointed mind. For a lot of people, a one-pointed mind means taking up an object, trying to concentrate on it, and pushing away everything else. And in a sense, that is true. But have you tried to focus on anything for a longer time? You know that it is almost impossible. It requires so much energy. It's so exhausting. It's so tiring to keep your mind focused on one thing for a longer period of time. You can do it for a few minutes, but then your mind wanders off. You may have seen that when you were younger, you were studying, you see that in work, you see that even if you're doing yoga practice, and you maybe even notice that now as you're listening to me, perhaps your mind wanders off in between and you have to bring it back to pay attention. So, a deeper understanding of a one-pointed mind is a mind that does not have conflicts. If you have to listen to me on Saturday evening and your mind is somewhere else because you actually wanted to go uh, and meet your friends and have a good time, obviously your mind is not one-pointed. Your mind is thinking about your friends and now they must be meeting, just about now they must be having a cup of coffee and just right now they're enjoying maybe some nice cake or, or, or sweets or chocolates or whatever and the mind is not paying attention. You are mentally somewhere else. So... This way, the mind keeps getting dragged off somewhere else. So in order to be one-pointed, what you have to do is really remove the conflict. When the conflict is removed, what is left? If you wouldn't have the thought of going meeting your friends, then you would be here, fully present. 
if you could have arranged it in such a way that you told your friends, let's meet before, because at this time, I've got to listen to the online meeting with Radhika Ji, <laughs> then you would have had your fun with your friends, and after that, you would be fully attentive during the online session. If that makes sense to you, you can see that we can do this, organize our life similarly in many areas. This should not, of course, become an excuse for indulgence and then say, oh, Radhika Ji said that I should have my fun. <laughs> but to do all of these things in an effective manner, in a disciplined manner, organize one's life in such a way that the mind is really focused on one thing. You can organize your day, for example. If you find yourself not very productive, very often we are not productive because we are trying to do too many things at a time. If the mind gets longer periods of time where it can focus and go deeper in a certain subject, it's very happy. The mind is very content and very happy and likes to go deeper into a certain subject. So then... Try to keep these chunks of time where you can work only on one thing instead of trying to multitask and do five or six different things simultaneously. So this is the idea of a one-pointed mind. So one-pointed mind and sankalp go together. So a one-pointed mind can so powerful, all great things can be achieved through such a power. And verse 16 says, Your mind is not one-pointed and concentrated. Therefore, you should learn to focus your mind. If you are not achieving something, it is immediately a sign that there is a conflict, that you are not focused, you are not one-pointed. Because if you would be focused and one-pointed, you would be successful. Verse 17. O Prince, let me explain the secret of time and space. This seems to be an amazing mystery to you, because you are not an adept. I can explain it clearly. It is the nature of the universe to appear in diverse forms. Light is one thing, yet it is experienced in two ways. For creatures like ours, who are blind during the day, it appears in the form of darkness, while for others it takes the form of light. Men and animals drown in water, while fish suffocate in air. Fire burns men and other creatures, but the titra, a legendary bird, swallows fire. Fire is extinguished by water, but flames thrive in, on oil. Thus, hundreds and thousands of objects are contrary to each other. Listen carefully, and I'll tell you the reason. Sight cannot exist without the eye. The diseased eye, like one afflicted with myopia, creates double vision. Well, myopia is short-sightedness, but anyway. Unusual vision is the product of diseased eyes. As eye disease can be cured by proper treatment, similarly, the mind's impurity can be removed by the right sadhana. So this example of the eyes is very interesting because when we do not see things correctly, our perception is warped. Similarly, the mind perceives things differently. You may have noticed that if you go watch a movie with somebody who who looks at the world very differently, has a different opinion in matters. And if you go to a movie with this person, you, you will find that you both have completely different ideas of what the movie is about and whether it's a movie is good or not. 
I am, for example, a big fan of Lord of the Rings. But I know that in my family, <laughs> there were people from my family who went to the movie when it first came out, that was years ago, and they walked out within the first 15 minutes. They said it was utter rubbish. <laughs> Uh, I'm a great fan of Lord of the Rings and I've watched it many, many times. I could not understand how anybody could walk out after half an hour or 15 minutes. But over the years, I have met many people who had a similar idea. They, they thought Lord of the Rings was, was totally silly stuff and made no sense. And... We see our perceptions differ because the mind differs, understanding of things differ. And so the eye is really the symbol of the mind and the way we see the whole of life. So just as we can cure the eye disease by wearing glasses or whatever other means like, or like surgery, Similarly, the impurities of the mind can be removed by the right sadhana, the right practice, to unlearn certain ways of thinking. In the eastern island of Karandaka, red is seen all the time. Everything is seen upside down on the island of Ramanaka. In the same way, on other islands, people perceive things differently according to their vision. If everyone sees things differently than his peers, he tries to cure what he considers to be his visual problem, so he can see the same way as everyone else does. This is a very interesting paragraph. It reminds me of this amazing classic novel, called Erewhon, and Erewhon is, is the word nowhere spelled backwards. And Erewhon is about an island where everybody is blind. And three people, three men, um, are cast away. They, they end up on this island when their ship uh, is lost in the storm and uh, they are washed ashore and everybody is blind on this island and after a while they started thinking that they are the ones who had a problem because the blind people thought that everything what they did was right and, and the people who had sight were wrong. We can see how we try also to fit into the way others think and behave. And those who have seen things differently in the world, who have been trying to change things, have often been accused of being heretics, of being, um, you know, troublemakers. They have been punished, imprisoned, tortured, murdered, crucified. And, um, yeah, that's because these people see the world differently. <clears throat> Whatever one sees in the world depends on the vision of the eye. In the same manner, taste, smell, sound and tactile sensation exist only in their corresponding senses. All men mental impressions are merely part of the mind. Time and space arise in the mental horizon. The relationship between time, space and objects is according to your estimate of them. Prince, listen. Inner reality is actually the cause of the universe. As the mirror supports the image, the universe is supported by the self-existent reality. The body is an external sheath. But how can it be excluded from its inner dweller? As the pot is different from the pot maker, so the body is different from the soul. 
the body is different from the seer, that which is seen is seen because of illumination. In the absence of that, nothing can be seen. Actually, all the illuminated objects are within the vision of the seer. The seer and the seen are not one and the same. The body or the mind cannot be the seer because, like the mountains and other objects, they can be seen by other lights. The self-illuminated seer does not need to be illuminated by any source because he is the only source of all light. So here is a very important distinction. It says to see anything else you need a light, but the self or the seer is self-illuminated. You don't need any other source of light because he is the only source of light. He is the light that illuminates other lights. <clears throat> Time and space are the extension of the self-illuminated being. For the self-illuminated existence, there is nothing like within and without. As the peak cannot be separated from the mountain, similarly, illumination cannot be separated from the self. The whole universe is always encompassed by light within and without. Such light is transcendental and is called Supreme Tripura, the Supreme Goddess. Those of the Veda call her Brahman. The Vaishnavites call her Vishnu. According to the Shivaites, she is Shiva. According to the Shakta, she is Shakti. So there are different names for the same one. We have the words like Brahman, Vishnu, Shiva, the Self, the Witness, many, many different terms for one and the same thing. Verse 64 As the image is pervaded by the mirror, this world is pervaded by the power of consciousness. All the objects in this universe are illuminated by that light. As the image of a city is not part of the mirror, similarly the universe is not a part of consciousness. As an image cannot be separated from a mirror, the universe cannot be separated from consciousness. This is the glory of the real self. Space is a void. As the world cannot be ascertained, neither can space be defined. This universe dwells in the self. But the question arises, why does consciousness assume the nature of darkness at the same time? If consciousness and brilliance are all pervading. Then from where were darkness and ignorance born? As the mirror contains the image, so the all-pervading consciousness pervades the universe by its power. A self-existent consciousness is within and without, it is single and dense, holds the immobile and the mobile universe in its womb. Unique in its nature, it has neither motivation nor cause. The mirror always remains unaffected. No matter how many images are reflected in it, it always retains its clarity. So is the case with self-illuminated consciousness. Through a sadhana, an advanced meditator can verify the different states, such as waking and dreaming. The young yogi said, O Prince, learn to examine your waking and dreaming states and the images constantly going through your mind. All these images are product of your mind. Consciousness remains unaffected before creation, after dissolution, and during the appearance of this world, as the mirror remains unaffected by the images reflected in it.
So if we just examine waking and dreaming state and we are able to observe these thoughts continuously moving, then you will begin to get a feeling that everything is transient. And it's all just images on a mirror and just like the universe is reflected on the mirror. It's, these are just images. But consciousness itself remains unaffected, just as the mirror remains unaffected. Verse 58 Through absolute self-existent reality manifests itself, yet that self-evident reality remains unblemished by its manifestation. The first step of creation was darkness. This marks the first step of manifestation and is called avidya or tamas. <clears throat> the appearance of the perfect, as if it were limited or imperfect, is avidya. The state in which absolute reality is separated from its purnahanta, perfect, I amness, and assumes that which is contrary to perfect I amness is called avyakta the unmanifest. The self-illuminated consciousness is named Shiva Tattva. When it is seen externally, it is called the individual feeling of Shakti Tattva. So this we are familiar with, Shiva and Shakti. So the feeling of pure consciousness is Shiva and everything that is externally seen is Shakti. The externally projected Mahashunya, great void, covered by Ahambhava, Ahamnes, is called Sadashiv. This same Sadashiv Tattva, when dominated by unconsciousness, is called Ishwar. The experience of both Sadashiv and Ishwar, which is simultaneously dualistic and non-dualistic, is called Shuddha Vidya. So we have different ideas now of Sadashiv, of Ishwar, Shuddha Vidya. We don't have to understand all of these. It's intellectual for you. But the basic concept that the self is pure consciousness and everything else that manifests is also consciousness, but it has taken on a separateness from pure consciousness. Since thus far the objective world supported by duality has not yet emerged, this level of creation is called Shuddha, pure creation. When under the influence of Svatantriya Shakti, the experience of duality gradually expands and Jada Shakti, unconsciousness, gradually dominates consciousness. Jada, jada also means tamas, so tamas is also a part of consciousness. The insent, insentient force is called maya shakti. There is a clear difference, exactly like the difference between the seed and the sprout. The sentient state is also called purusha. So that part which is pure consciousness is also called Purusha, it's also called Shiva, it's also called the Self. And it is seated within the five sheets, Kala, Vidya, Raga, Kala and Niyati. Limited ability to act is called Kala. Limited power to know is called Vidya. Desire is rag, and limited lifespan is kal. So, first one is kala, and the second one is kal. So, kala is limited ability to act, and kal is the limited lifespan. So, these are the limitations. Putting things in proper order is called Niyati. That's the law of the universe. 
consciousness combined with these three, sorry, these five limiting factors is called Purusha. The individual soul remains in the bondage of karma, both negative and positive. It supports the power of intelligence within and is called Prakriti. The results of karma are threefold, pleasant, neutral and unpleasant. Prakriti is also threefold, sattvic, rajasic and tamasic, having the quality of light, activity and inertia respectively. A particular state assumed by the chitta is called Prakriti. So, I think everybody is familiar with the idea of Shiva is pure consciousness and Prakriti or Shakti is that which is the more active element, the dynamic element. And this dynamic element, Prakriti, is threefold. There's the sattvic part, which has the quality of light. The rajasic part has the quality of activity. And the tamasic part is inert. That which is called Prakriti in the state of deep sleep is called Chitta in the waking state. Because it is full of latent desires, it remains in an unmanifest form. It differs according to the individuals and their latent desire. So what happens in deep sleep? We have many desires. It's full of latent desires. All the desires that have been unfulfilled. And they remain in their unmanifested state there. In deep sleep, all individual souls are alike. So coming out of that state, each individual soul differs. That makes perfect sense. When we're all sleeping and we're all in deep sleep, there's no difference between us. We all seem to be the same. But when we're talking about dream state, everybody has different dreams. We're no longer the same. And when we're in the waking state, we all have different personalities, we speak different languages, we look different, we have different ideas. So in deep sleep, the desires are latent, they are sleeping. So, everybody seems to be the same. Like many seeds which have not germinated. And when consciousness is predominant, it's called Purusha. When the unmanifest power is predominant, it's called Prakriti. According to its various functions, the same Chitta is called Ankara, Buddhi and Manas. The modifications of chitta are ego, the faculty of discrimination, and mind. That is called antakarna. So antakarna is when we have three aspects, ankara, buddhi, and manas. And these are all just part of the same consciousness. It's not really different. It's just the same. It's just depending on what point of view we are looking at it from. And that is called antakarna, the inner instrument. Now you can see that this young yogi is actually explaining to Mahasena, to the prince, the origin of the universe, how the universe developed. He's going from the internal, from Shiva, to the external. He's, he talked about the deep sleep, dream, waking state. He's talking about the, the sattvic, rajasic and tamasic gunas. You know, he's talking about the mind at the level of the mind. So he's going steadily outward into the universe and explaining this. From these three modifications are born five subtle senses, five gross senses, Space, water, fire, wind and earth. So now we've come down right to the most gross part of consciousness, which is the elements. In this way, absolute consciousness herself, the witness of all, appears as the universe, as if it were external to her. That which is the prime cause of this universe is called Tripura Shakti. From its desire was born Brahma, and from the will and determination of Brahma, this universe came into existence. 
and that which is I and you is pure consciousness. So basically everything is consciousness. Diversity in the universe appears because of the many phases of consciousness. When the universe dissolves, then one cannot differentiate between the real and unreal. Consciousness in you is veiled by the power of Maya. When that veil is lifted, consciousness shines in its glory and Chitta Shakti shines forth. According to time and space, individuals perceive objects as large, long, short and small. Sorry. One day to me is equal to 12,000 years of Brahma. Space of two and a half miles of Brahma is infinite to me and encompasses the whole creation. Both versions have their validity. For example, if one imagines a hill within himself, also imagines the entire universe within that hill, that concept will last as long as his imagination lasts. In the practical world, strong willpower is important. Opens this universe, reflects in the mirror of consciousness. That which looks like the universe is an image in the mirror. The image appears in the mirror only through the power of consciousness. Consciousness is like a screen and the image is the universe. The Arabs know the secret of time and space for they have gone beyond. The yogis eliminate space in a fraction of a second and have the power of perceiving the whole universe like a seed on the palm. O Prince acknowledge the fact that the universe is an image of the mirror of consciousness. Concentrate with a one-pointed mind on the self. Be free from the delusion that the world is real. Then you will also obtain freedom as I have by cutting the bondage of ignorance asunder. So the teachings of the yogi are basically that develops such a strong willpower, you can get whatever you imagine. And if you want to have self-realization, you have self-realization. You will shatter with your strong willpower the bondage of ignorance. So we come back to Dattatreya. Dattatreya says to Parshurama, Parshurama, by having satsang with the sage's son, the prince's ignorance was dispelled and his faculty of discrimination became sharp and purified. Finally, he knew his ultimate goal. Then he practiced the technique of samadhi. For attaining samadhi, he did not depend on external crutches. His life became happy and his lifespan was extended. He no longer identified himself with his body or any other object of the world. He became illuminated and finally attained liberation. O Parshurama, remember that this universe is only an image and it has no existence of its own. With the help of contemplation, doubt will be removed from your mind. So, in short, this chapter tells us, remove doubts, remove conflicts, attain a one-pointed mind, and use that Sankar Shakti, one-pointed mind, to attain your goal, which is self-realization. While self-realization may not be your personal goal, it is ultimately what we all are seeking. And this is evolution, the process we all are going through. And while you may say, right now, oh, I would like to get married, I want to have children, I want a house... I want a job, I want a career, I want to be famous. You may have all these little goals and little desires, but deep inside, all this is part of that wonderful play of consciousness and what you really want deep inside is to know yourself and be free, be liberated. 
uh, tin moksha. We only have to go through this painful process of freeing ourselves of this ignorance. And to do that, we need to remove our doubts, remove conflicts, acquire a one-pointed mind, and with Sankal Shakti, shatter this ignorance and become one with the self and stay established in it. Well, on that note, we stop here. We'll continue next time.